So first things first, I think it was chapter six, seven. Yeah, that's right. Uh, figures of speech. I should have brought in my my book, the one I showed. Oh, Tim's is Tim here? Yeah, the one I mentioned the other. What yesterday? Mo no, this morning. Uh, yeah, um, on figures on, on figures of speech, uh, but. Uh, Hopefully you found that to be a good chapter, interesting one. Uh, hopefully you, you learned um, a lot. There's figures of speech is a, well, just the idea on how, how many figures of speech we use is just amazing. Um, and the benefit of using them is probably more than, than we can even think about. He gives a lot of the benefits in the, in the thing, and, and he does talk about you know some of the more uh, more common uh, more common ones. Uh, there are far more than than he would ever list in here. Matter of fact, I was I have a book in my office that's about this size. That is not all of the figures of speech in the Bible. It's just a random sampling of figures of speech in the Bible, and it, they are just and the, you know the table of contents is that big. There are just hundreds of different types of figures of speech, and and uh, and they're interesting. And I was, uh, well, and you know, so they're they're worth studying. They're worth being able to 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 recognize um, as we um, as we read through uh, through the through the scriptures. Any questions on chapter seven? As you read through it, I think, think we have a class we're going to devote to figures of speech later, I think. Um, I have to look at my... Um, but, um, but any questions on your reading? It was a long chapter. It was intense. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's something that... Like, I, I went through and highlighted the, some of the ones, but I think it's something that I literally should type up and have a list so that I can work on understanding it and doing them because... Most of them I was very unfamiliar with. Yeah, the, the, the names of it, the categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, good. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So, let's... look at a little bit more on observation. There it is. Uh, so the the first thing that um, that we've probably have talked a little bit about, but I, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on it, and just kind of help us see that the benefit in in interpretation is to observe the context of, of where we are. And, and context is, a, um, is an important term in Scripture. I expect some of you, have, you know, have, are familiar with the adage, you know, the three most, important, three most important issues of real estate is what? Location, 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 right? And we say the same thing about Bible interpretation. The three most important things about Bible interpretation are context, context, and context. So it is very, very important. Uh, context is important in all speech. Usually, again, we, you know, we don't have to think about context, but even in this particular context, pun intended, um, you know, we are, we are talking about things, I'm using words, and you've already determined you know, much of the context. There is a, a history to this class that we've been through. There's a place where it's going. Uh, you know that this, that this, what we're sitting here doing is not, for example, we're not in the kitchen baking cupcakes. Uh, so you know that context immediately. Uh, there's just a lot of things you've already processed, both major all the way down to minor, uh, that goes into making sure communication happens well. Same thing in the scripture. The only difference is it's not always so natural. So you kind of have to make sure you... You check all the boxes, 
and, and fundamentally, in, uh, when we talk about Scripture, if you want to go to the, to the widest possible context of, let's just throw a text up, 2 Timothy 5.1. I don't even know what it says. Okay, and so the biggest possible context that 2 Timothy 5.1 has got to fit in is what? What's the largest context you have to take into account? Well, that's, that's one you need to do. You need to go even larger. You need the entire scripture. How does 2 Timothy 5.1 fit into the scripture? We're going to talk a little bit more about that in some other areas when we talk about analogy of faith uh, and these type of things that will come up later. But how does it fit into the in entire scripture? Okay. Uh, What's that? It's towards the end. Um, it, well, that would be an, an aspect of the scriptural context. It is. It's towards, towards the end of the, you know, and so when we break down, when we break down the big context, usually after you go to, to, to the entire scripture, what would be the next kind of thing you want to make sure you understand 2 Timothy in relationship to what? New Testament. New Testament, really. You know, and it, it makes sense. We're just going from big to kind of, Littler and littler and littler. And so then you, you need to think about it in the context of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, you're automatically going to think about it as you break up the New Testament a little bit. It's, it's in the context of what? The epistles. Okay, because not the Gospels. It's not Revelation. It's in, well, we'll put them here. It's in, it's, it's in, the, it's in the epistles. And then even in the epistles, you're going to say, okay, this is, this is one of Paul's epistles. Uh, this is a later epistle of Paul. And you're going, to, you're going to understand that the epistles, okay, they come, you know, the context in which they fit is not the same as clearly the prophet Daniel, which is a different context. And so you're, it's going to affect how you look at it, how you understand it, how you how you, uh, how you interpret it. And so, again, just kind of understanding where it fits until you actually get down then to the context of where does this verse fit into 2 Timothy and where does it fit into chapter 5, you know? And, and so you're just kind of narrowing it down, uh, you know... Where do you start when you're talking about context? Do you start little and go big? Do you start big and, and go little? Uh, ideologically, you can't know the big unless you know, unless you know the little. Um, but in a sense, it's hard to know. The, if you've got to find the context, you need to know the little. So I can tell you where I start. I start big and I go little, okay? I start, where does this fall? My mind just starts with, where does it fall in the context of the Bible? Uh, which testament? Which genre of literature in the testaments? What's going on with the epistles? When I'm reading an epistle already and I'm thinking 2 Timothy, I know it's in the context of the latter part of Paul's ministry, not the early part. I know it was written to an individual. So I'm, I go from bigger to little, uh, I don't know that there, that there is a, a, a right or, or a wrong, but I think that probably all of you in this room probably have enough general knowledge of the scripture that that, that also works. Uh, and if you, if you say, you know, and if you don't, then this may be a place to say, well, you know, what is the context of the epistles? You know, when we're, you know what, is the, what is the idea in which they are written? And, and when you think about the context of the epistles, the, the first thing you should think about is the epistles were not written during the life of Jesus. The epistles were written after the church was started, okay, during the age of the church. And so it's, that's the, it's the context of when they were, when they were, when they were written. Um, and so, so you, you, need to think, you need to think through that. Um, as you think through <clears throat> context and as you think through individual books, what you also want to do is be, try, is be thinking in the book, not just chapter 5, and I talked about that, but it's probably not the best way to think about it in a little book like this it is. But if you've got a big book like a gospel or something like that, 
you really, it's, you, you need to think in larger sections. How is, how is the book broken up? You know, what are the, the main sections of the book? Because different books are, 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 are sectioned uh, in different ways. Um, for example, the um, uh, Genesis. Uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are pre-flood. The second, well, from, from 1 to 11 is everything that happened before Abraham, and 12 on is everything that happened after Abraham. When you think about it, 1 through 11 in Genesis, and then 12 to 50, 1 through 11, if we take creation at 4000 BC, 1 through 11 covers 2,500, no, 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 it would cover 2,000, 2,000 years. This covers 100 years. All right, I mean, that's a major division. I mean, you can see I'm barreling through the history of the world to get to the history of the patriarchs, which is the history of what? Israel, okay? Uh, so where you fall, and, and there's lots of clues in books as to how to break it up. Uh, Joshua is divided up into what type of these, these battle epochs in the book of, of, uh, of Joshua. Um, almost all of your New Testament epistles, eh, most. Uh, there's a major division in most New Testament epistles that kind of divide them in half. Maybe not literally physical half, but, but they divide them in half. First half of most epistles, who knows this, is what? Theology. Theology. Second half is what? Personal application. Personal application. The epistles, not all of them, but the vast majority will divide along those lines, sometimes right dab smack in the middle. Right? And so you should know that. You know, now, it doesn't mean that in the theology section there's no personal application, and it doesn't mean in the personal application section there's no theology. There is. There's overlap between the two, but it's a clear division. All right? uh, and so, so you should know that. Uh, the Book of Romans is an interesting one. Anybody ever? Book of Romans is pretty easy to, to lay out, um, at least the, the first part of it. The whole thing is... But, but the first part has got a, a lot of really, uh, really easy stuff. You know, chapters 1 through 3 of Romans is condemnation. We have all have sinned. 4 and 5 is justification. And 6, 7, and 8 is sanctification. Right now, there's some, you know, a little bit of verse. I'm giving you general breakup, but you can find the precise breakup, and almost any, almost any outline of the book of, of Romans is gonna, is gonna give you this. So when you're going through Romans, if I'm somewhere in here, I'm in, I'm in the context of condemnation, and, and I need to, to keep that in mind. I remember when we went through the book of Romans a number of years ago, and. Um, and you know, we, and, and we went a little bit slower than we do now, um, not, not a great deal. And I remember thinking by the time we got to Romans chapter 3, all right, I get it. <laughs> can, can we not go on <laughs> to something other than, you know, you dirty, no good sinners. Um, and it was, uh, uh, but, but that was the context in which we were in, and so it, it drove how we were to understand and to apply, because if we understand it properly, then we'll apply it properly, you know, whatever text uh, we, we were in. Um, Kings and Chronicles, they're, they're broken up by what? Kings. Kings, dynasties. Um, and, and there's a little bit about epochs in Kings and Chronicles, the epoch before the Assyrian captivity. Uh, and then after the Assyrian captivity, but before the Babylonian, and then after the Babylonian. Uh, an interesting thing when you look at uh, how, uh, how, how things are broken up, uh, the book of Chronicles, and this you may, not, you may not recognize, book of Chronicles much more centered around the priestly things of going on, the book of Kings much more around the prophetic, you know, Elisha and Elijah and these guys. Uh, so those type of things help us break it up a little bit. Moses got bust up into the northern and southern kingdoms too, because they keep 
bouncing back and forth. Keep, yeah, yep, yeah, not and not just northern and southern, but sometimes foreign nations. You know, they, um, well, I guess not in Kings and Chronicles. I'm thinking of prophets, but yeah. Uh, the book of Habakkuk. Anybody know how Habakkuk is broken up? We studied that a long time ago. That's why I know that too. Questions and answers. Habakkuk asks God questions. Three of them, actually. And then God answers. It's a short book, so it's not a long book. And if you read it, you'll see really clearly that it's broken up into these, these, these questions. And so... So as you're thinking through the context, you, in a sense, by understanding how the book is broken up, you, you, you got a good idea of the overarching context of where the book is, where it's going. And I happen to be right now, you know, in this particular section. All right. And so I know just before I even begin my interpretation, I know that I'm in, I'm in this, this, this piece that's dealing with sanctification. And somehow my text is going to fit into that overarching context, and it's going to drive what my overarching, uh, what, what my text, uh, my text means. So, so the context is uh, is an important uh, part um, of all that. Uh, uh, questions, thoughts, Sarah. So, say you started in, you didn't know that Romans. Out, out how it breaks up. So then I would look at the whole book and kind of try to work at doing something yeah. similar to that. Like yeah. I'm just thinking of it. Um, so if, if you're gonna like say you're asked to 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 either you're either you're studying for your own personal benefit or, or you're looking at something to teach for something, uh, ideally, uh, ideally you you would first understand Romans, read it, and try to understand it and be able to lay this, this type of stuff out. Uh, practically speaking, uh, that's, you know, there, there, are, there are things that can help us get there, uh, get there quicker. Uh, and and you, can never, you can never use helps as a crutch, but you can use them as, as, a, as a help. So if, you know, I would say in your situation, if you know it would you would profit ben, you would profit greatly by spending your own time reading Romans six or seven times wrestling with it and then you know trying to you know put it all together um, but you would not profit poorly if you went to a good reputable source and said okay you know what is the overarching theme of of Romans um, how should it be broken up and those things can be, can be very profitable uh, for you. You can never take things like that without any critical examination, um, but you certainly you know, should, should learn the ability to, to, you, to use them, and, and they're faithful. And then you know, when you get in there, and you know, uh, you know, if, if you find that you disagree with how somebody broke it up, then you can always, you can always wrestle with that. But, but we're, we're, you know, we have lots of, lots of helps. Um, what type of things help? Um, uh, well, if you have a study Bible, most study Bibles have an introduction to every book, and it'll give you what's the theme of the book. Okay, that's the overarching message of all of Romans. And then there's probably going to be a, there may be an outline of Romans, and I guarantee you, it'll, if, if it's of anybody, of any reputable source, this one is just a, a no-brainer, they're going to follow this type of an, of, a, of an outline. And so reading, reading in your study Bible introductory material will help you get a good big picture. You gotta make sure you have a good one. Don't read in, MacArthur. you know, MacArthur Study Bible would be very good. The Ryrie Study Bible is very good. Um, a good Bible handbook, um, Erdman's or somebody else uh, is, is a good, um, what's the other one we, uh, what do we call it? Uh, <laughs> there's another term for it. Uh, it gives a synopsis of each book and then kind of a breakdown section by section What's that? Survey? Uh, well, a survey will do a similar type of thing that can be very profitable. Get a good Bible survey and just read on that particular section. Those are all, all helpful. But uh, yeah, those are ways to, to kind of get it, to get it in your mind, uh, and then start digging into it. Um, I, you should really never, if somebody says, can you teach a Bible study on Romans 5? You should never do that until you've done at least some cursory understanding 
of of Romans of Romans five. Raymond. My question. My question was, um, what can we take, or what is it that we're seeking to expunge from Scripture that, like numerous past scholars haven't already expunged already, like historical context or grammatical context? What can I um, take out from Scripture that hasn't already been done? Great. Great, and let me give you the absolute right answer. <laughs> if you come up with something that's never been found before, it probably ain't true. Matter of fact, I'll say even, I guarantee you, Raymond, just dump it. I might be a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right? Now, a question to ask. It was a great question to ask. Uh, but that doesn't mean that... Obviously, there's lots of bad stuff out there also. Um, that's why it's important to find those who have shown themselves to be good and faithful exegetes are coming from the right philosophy, the right foundation of one meaning, you know, the right background, and, and you, 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 you get help from those guys. I, I'm still racking my mind to think, what is this book? I see it on my shelf. There's a term, handbooks. Bible handbook. That's the term I was looking for. Yeah. Just so like if you have a commentary or something, you're wanting to, you know, really, like at what point would you suggest like using that? Going to a commentary? Yeah. It's a great question. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but in case I don't remember to talk about it, uh, you do not go to a commentary until you have finished your, 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 your task of observation. Okay, so and maybe this is, is an exception if part of observation is getting that, but when you're in the text, getting observations from the text, do that before you go to your commentary. Do, your own, do whatever work you can on your own first, and then go to the commentary to aid you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, so some other things that we want to um, observe in the text, and, and we'll try to do some examples of this uh, as much as, as, uh, as we can. And matter of fact, if you have your little cheat sheet, uh, most of this stuff is, is on your cheat sheet. But we'll talk about it more in detail. So, so things we want to observe. We want to observe the context. We've already talked about that. Uh, number two, we want to observe things that are emphasized. <coughs> And this is a, a general term, and you know, what do you mean emphasized, and in, uh, in, 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 in what way? And there's lots of ways to, to kind of figure out what's being, what is emphatically said. Um, uh, one of them is simply, simply uh, um, you know, how much space is given to it. If a lot of space is given to it, um, it, it, is, uh, it, is, it is emphatic. Uh, let me see, I had a note here, Mark 2.10. Trying to remember why. Go, go ahead and turn to Mark 2.10. Let me see if, if it makes sense. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's very, um, uh, here, here we have, we have the, the thing that is emphasized, stated right in the text. Now this is a bigger context. Mark 2.10 would really be, you know, verses 1 through 12. Um, but Mark 2.10 is an, is an emphatic statement. How do I, how do I know that that's, talk, that that's an emphatic part of this statement? How do, how do I know that, that that part is something Mark wants to make sure we get? But. But that. That. It gives his purpose. You know, you know <laughs> that in order that. You know, it's a stated it's a stated purpose, so that makes it emphatic. Let me give you one that's a little bit, uh, maybe not as obvious. Go to Romans chapter 10. And here you have to, have to kind of actually know um, a literary technique. Anybody else hot besides me? A little bit warm. Any, anybody cold? No? Okay. Um, Romans 10 is a passage you're probably all, all familiar with, um, starting in verse 11. 
For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches to all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And so he gets into this reverse order, you know, from, from verse 13, which is the end, you know, which, you know, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, okay? But then before they can call, you know, they have to, you know, they have to believe. Before they believe, they have to hear. Before they hear, somebody's got to preach. Before they can preach, somebody's got to send them. And so you have actually five steps here. And in this particular text, uh, the, the emphatic statement is, well, what, if you had to take a guess, what would be the emphatic of the five? Being sent. What's that? Being sent is the actual emphatic. It's the correct answer, but I'm surprised nobody kind of thought, well, the first one, right? You got to, you know, how can they, you know, you got to believe. Um, but here we have something called end stress that, and the reason why he went backwards, he wanted to end with the emphatic statement. And so then you, and that's why you get on to, just as it is said, how beautiful are those who bring good tidings, of, you know, good news of good things. He's emphasizing the sending. You know, it's, and, and so he's putting it, although it's the first thing that happens, he builds up to it. Uh, and so that would be an emphatic, um, emphatic statement because of end stress. Um, next thing. This is a little easier. Uh, things that are repeated. This is actually a great little thing to keep in mind. It's not hard to do. Uh, and and uh, and it will it will bear you a lot of fruit. Go to Romans four. Um, let me just read, let me start reading in verse 3, uh, and, and just listen closely. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but what is due. But the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man of God to whom God reckons righteous apart from works. Now I could go on, and if I went on, there, there's something that's consistently been repeated just in that little part I talked. What was it? What's been repeated over and over and over? Not righteousness. Reckon. The term reckon is what? Five times in there? And if you continue going on, it still keeps coming up and up and up. So this idea of reckoning, whatever it be, here it happens to be righteousness, this is a key issue. You know, how do you gain your righteousness? Do you earn it? Well, actually not. It's reckoned to me. And so the emphatic, the thing that this, this is also an emphasis, but we know it's an emphasis because it continue, he continues to, uh, to repeat it. Um, you know, a, a simpler example uh, Hebrews, and you probably don't even need to turn there. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, what's repeated? Faith. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. So it's like, okay, well, obviously that's central to what, to what he's, you know, he's driving at. Uh, and so, you know, things, you know, may be an individual that's, that's repeated over and over and over. It, you know, it could, be, it could be words, and words are the easiest things to, um, to, to kind of notice with that. But when something is, is repeated or stated again, uh, and sometimes they'll even... Well, here, let's, let's do another easy one. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. Hmm... Verse 8, 
But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. <laughs> All right, now, it can't get more repetitive than that. If you didn't hear me the first time, let me tell you a second time, that is clearly an emphatic statement. I mean, everything the Bible says is important, but the Apostle Paul is like, you can't miss this. Uh, and so, uh, so things that are, that are repeated um, are, are very important for us. If you have questions, just, just toss them out. Um, and um, if not, I'll just keep going. Uh, things that, uh, that are related. Things that are related. And here related, you know, well, once again, before I get into this one, once again, let me just emphasize the fact that, that these, these techniques, like the who, what, when, where, and why, are tools. Okay? They're tools to an end. They're not the end. If you, if, you know, uh, and so, so they're purposely meant to be broad and just to cause you to look. Well, related in what way? I don't care. I don't care how they're, but if they're related, that's probably something important for you to understand. So, so you may think about it in different, in a sense, words. Uh, the Romans 10 passage we did, all of those things were related. There was five of them. How can, they, you know, how can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless they preach? How can they preach unless they're sent? Those things are all related. And so you would note that, and you should note that, and... And in that, there's an end stress to it, so the last one is stressed, um, but all of them are, uh, are, are related. Um, another time when you get things that are related, Mark, uh, go to Mark 11. So should seeing things that are related kind of cause us to question and dig deeper? should cause you to, just, at, at this point, you're just observing them. You're noting them. And, and you're, you want to make some type of, of physical notation, not just a mental one, that, you know, if, uh, and, and matter of fact, you know, you can, you know, you can, you can, you, you can do this in your, in your Bible, but certainly on a piece of paper. In that Romans 10 passage, when you get to those lists, you can tell that they're related. He's given a sequence. And so just number them, one, two, three, four, five. These are all related. Um, you see uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Those are all related. And so one, two, three, four, five. I need to come back and look at this. This is obviously important. He's, he's listing these lists of things um, uh, for us. Uh, Mark 11. Let me get to 11. Twenty-seven through thirty-three, um, and they came to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple. And the chief priests and scribes came to him and began saying to him, "By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you the authority?" Jesus said to them, "I will ask you one question. You ask me, and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things." Was the baptism of John, and here things that are related, and however you notice this doesn't matter. Here we have a series of questions and answers. Questions and answers are related. Uh, I, I mentioned Habakkuk. You know, Habakkuk asks a question, God answers the question. Those are, those are related issues, okay? Uh, and so you should note that, somehow note, okay, here's a question. Matter of fact, there's two questions. Well, Jesus answers the question with a question and, and those type of things. Um, so note, note that um, cause and effect, uh, because of this, then that, uh, is, is an issue of... Uh, of uh, um, of, of things that are related. Uh, this, and, and it's going to come up later again, but um, uh, inferential conjunctions. You know what an inferential conjunction is? Somebody give me a... Has, has a connection, yeah. It, it infers or relates to something else, um, and typically it's therefore. Da 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 da. Therefore, 
da 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 and that conjunction tells you these two things are related. There's a, a maybe a cause and an effect. Uh, and so certain conjunctions will, will help you see that. And we'll talk a lot more about conjunctions because, because the conjunctions are really, really helpful in, uh, in lots of, of observation things. But find things that, are, that, are, that, that seem related and note them. Note that there's something going on here. Uh, things that are contrasted or compared. Things that are contrasted or, or compared. Uh, let's go to Galatians 5. Matter of fact, I think that's the fruit of the Spirit passage, isn't it? Galatians 5. Now, when you want to, um, again, conjunctions are a big help here, and we'll talk more about conjunctions later. Um, but in, in Galatians 5, 19, oh, I think, oh, I didn't say I'm in Ephesians, no wonder it doesn't work. Galatians 5. 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you and have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those two things are contrasted. And there again, there's an, you can tell they're contrasted. That you don't have to use the word but. You know, but, you know, the word but being there helps us, but is a contrastive conjunction um, and is a coordinating conjunction. So things that are alike will often have an and in between them. Things that are contrasted will have a, uh, will have a, uh, um, 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 a but in between them. So, so again, conjunction is very, 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 very helpful. Um, uh, comparisons, the kingdom the kingdom of heaven is like, you know, those are all comparisons, all of those parables or extended metaphors or extended figures um, of speech. You want to you want to you want to know that and, and your observation would be something like, you know, that this is a comparison. This word like is there or or just as da 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 da. So da 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 da. You know, those terms tell you there's some type of a comparison or a relationship between these things, and you want to note that. And, and later you'll, you'll go back and try to figure out what significance um, it has. And, and with that, you have these, you know, these key words, you know, and, but, therefore, like, as, all of these words um, are, are, are going to be important to you um, to see where, where things where things in the text are, are focusing on. Uh, thoughts, questions, any of that? You mentioned earlier that um, before you can give it like a study on a book or anything, our first step is to observe and do the work within that book that's required. Yeah, yeah, oh, you could, um, you can make these type of observations because the, these are just observations. And observing the context is, is also an observation. And you can kind of do that at the end. So you could, you could be doing all of this before you pulled out your Bible survey and studied the book. Um, so it's not, it, it, you could do it first. But, uh, but again, when we get into interpretation, you know, then that's gonna become become more important. Before you get to interpretation, you need to make sure you observe the context uh, in the entire book. Maybe that's the best way to say it. How do you go about observing references? What do you mean? So like, uh, you know, Jesus references the Old Testament. Yeah, mm -hmm. when it goes back. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist, you know, further back in the... Yeah, you, you talking about like when they quote the Old Testament? That specifically, but also they'll reference, you know, earlier parts that are mentioned in the gospel. Or oh, okay, yeah. Um, you know, same, same kind of issue of context always applies, and that, that can make Old Testament quotes a little bit, you know, it makes, makes it more work, because to, to really understand 
why he's quoting that quote and what that quote means, you kind of have to go back and look at where it came from and what did it mean and, and why is he why he's doing it. So you kind of got to do the whole process now in, in another area. Yeah, it does, it does, add, it does add another layer of, of, uh, of intensity to it. Mm -hmm. uh, observing, some of, some of this is, is, you'll see is, is again somewhat redundant, but observing key words. Uh, and this could be any word. I've already told you that all that's are keys. Almost all conjunctions are keys. Um, but but there's, there's, there's often other words that are key to the passage. We saw that in, in Romans, the key word was reckon. And we saw that because he repeated it. Won't always be repeated. Um, but key words are those words that that the story or the account kind of turns on. Uh, and, and this takes a little bit of practice and, um, and you may not, well, let me, let me, you may not even notice the real key word until after you, till after you get into the interpretation phase. But, um, but when, when you're going through on your initial observation, a key word that you would, that you would and what I would do is I, I circle them. So, because these are my key words. Key word would be anything that I don't know what it means, because then it could be key, um, and I don't know it because I don't know the meaning of the word. So I'd circle that word. Uh, any word that seems central to uh, to the text, and this is where the this is where the the um, the trick comes in. You've heard you heard the old Sunday school joke, right? Uh, that all, all answers are Jesus, okay, right? You've heard that. And so the teacher asked the class, well, what has four legs, a fuzzy tail, and climbs up trees? And everybody's just this dead silence, you know. And one little boy in the back of the hand raises his hands and says, well, I think you're talking about a squirrel, but I'm going to say Jesus, <laughs> you know. And, and we do that in lots of places of Scripture. We see words like Jesus, or faith, or grace, these words that are very key in the Bible. Key words, just because it is a key word in the Bible does not mean it is, the key word, it is a key word in your text. And, and, our, and our tendency is to go to these $20 words and say, well, this is always key. And it isn't always key. Sometimes the key word is... is uh, for example, um, and we're going to get there here shortly, Philippians chapter 2 talks about the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins and the emptying of himself, the kenosis, in order to come to earth, take on the flesh, and die on the cross. All right? There's a lot of high-powered things there. The key word in the Philippians 2 passage, does anybody know the passage well enough to take a jab at it? Is humility. Okay, that's the key word, which is not any of those things that, that we're thinking of. Uh, and, and in that particular passage, the entire sacrificial event of Jesus Christ simply becomes a, an example of humility. I mean, it's, it's like, wow, that, that's, that's, you know, that's a pretty powerful example. It is a powerful example. But Paul is teaching humility in that text, not Christology. He uses some really good Christology. Um, but the key word is humility. And if you get into that text and you're all about the death of Jesus Christ or the emptying of Jesus Christ, although those are good peripheral issues, and you never talk about humility, you have missed the meaning of the text because you missed a key word. Does that make sense? Um, so, uh, let's do, I got Romans 6 in here twice and I haven't gone to it either time yet. So let's go to Romans 6 and see why I put it down twice. <laughs> Things repeated, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah. Uh, go to, let me see. Uh, you know, for an easy example, go to Romans 8, verse 9. And you could have, you know, you can have multiple key words. Key words are things that, that, that you're going to circle and say, you know what, I need to go back and look at these things. But in Romans 8, 9, um, if I was looking at that, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. If I was looking at this and studying this, you know, some of the things I'd say, you know, some words that here look key to me that I need to, I need to do more work on, um, one of them would be in. What does it mean in the flesh and in the Spirit? Right? I, would, I would put that down as a, as a key word. Somehow I, I need, to, need to understand that. You know, both flesh and spirit, you know, what does that mean? You know, this, actually, there's a lot here. Um, a key word, dwells, uh, is, uh, you know, something that I probably need to, need, to, uh, need to understand. So here, there's probably four or five key words that I'm going to circle, and I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to go back and, and, look, and look more into these. I may find that what I thought was a key word was really not all that important, um, and I may find that it was very important, but I'm I'm going to observe what looks like what looks like keywords. However, was not one you were speaking. Um, however, should be yeah should kind of circle that as I need to you know figure out you know because here just out of the middle of nowhere you know where does the however however would be kind of a of a contrastive okay um, therefore more of a more of a coordinating. Um, so yeah, I think that would that would certainly be a, a good word to to, to pen down. Um, so, any other thoughts on any of that? Okay, or questions. When you're observing the text, do you observe it within the context of the English language, or should I be thinking, oh, that however is an observative word, but in the Greek it means this or that? I don't know those things. So I can only think in the English language, but... Yeah, um, if you don't know Greek, you can't use it. So I should just focus, I should just focus and, on studying my scripture within the context of... Yeah, what, what your, your, your exhortation is important, um, but the, the, the means to, to protect yourself from finding things that aren't there is to have a good... English translation. I think I've said that before, and I'll say it a thousand, thousand times. Don't study. Not every Bible is created. Not every translation is created equal, and some are worth no more than to maybe read at the bedtime before you go to bed, um, because there, they, there is too much interpretation, too much messing with the text, and and if if I need to notice these conjunctions. I can't notice, they're there in the Greek, I can't notice them in English unless the translator gave me the conjunction. And, and so a good text is just fundamental. Um, and, and, I, and again, there are, there are more bad texts in English than good ones. The good texts that you should be using in English, are, you can count on one hand, okay, that, that you should. What's that? Um, the ones that I, that I would say, uh, King James is, is a great translation, but the, but the English is too archaic. New King James is very, very good translation, very literal. Um, New American Standard is very good. Uh, the um, um, Young's literal translation is a good one to study from, but not necessarily to read from. Um, uh, the ESV is, is, is in the same category, not quite as good. They're a little bit a little bit loosier and goosier than I would appreciate them to be. Uh, the Christian uh, Standard, uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible is, is, uh, is a pretty good translation. Um, what else is out there? RSV I would stay away from, NIV I would stay away from. Um, 
Uh, what are other major ones out there? Okay, but those are new. What the second one? New. Uh, the, you know the easy. The, the easy at this point, and and this is a moving ship. This is a moving ship because I actually heard that the new new American Standard is is not one you want to buy. Um, I you know the original one was very good. The update in 1995 was still very good, but they got rid of a few things they shouldn't have. Um, and the new one I heard is probably not worth buying at all. Um, so, so make sure you know which, which rendition of the New American Standard. New King James uh, is, is, is a really, really good translation. Um, the only issue with the New King James is that they use, they use, um, they use as primary um, a, uh, a less reliable manuscript, although they reference the other ones. And, and that's an issue of both the New and Old King James are the same way. It's, it is an issue, it's not a major issue. It's a minor issue. Um, but that's the only reason that in my mind the New American Standard stands a little bit better than the, than the King James is because of the manuscript um, evidence. So, so that's an easy one to go with. Um, good translation, good keeping nouns, nouns, verbs, verbs, conjunctions, conjunctions. Uh, so, yeah. Since we're uneducated in the, old, the original languages, I've had people back home like try to make a case for something based off, oh no, but this means that in the Greek. Yeah. Well, with knowing what I know now about how complicated this is, you probably shouldn't even be touching that. So next time they do that, have in your back pocket a Greek rendition of the New Testament and say, okay, could you show me, show me even where that is. Can you even find it in the Greek New Testament? Because I suspect you can't even read the book titles in the Greek New Testament, let alone have an understanding of what the Greek is. So, I mean, you know, you, yeah, somebody who says that who doesn't know Greek is simply relying on somebody else who told them they said that. Um, and, and so it's only as good as the reliability of that, that person. So. But there are some references, though, to it'll say when they use this particular word, sometimes they'll say it's only used once. Sometimes they'll say you, they'll use this particular word like in two or three spots. At least you can kind of see the context of where they use that same yeah, word. Yeah, there can be some helps. But even in some, even in some very basic things that you probably all would be familiar with, um, there, even there it's not all that accurate. I mean, you're familiar with the word agape, right? The Greek word for what? Love. And so is phileo, right? Um, which one is a? Which one is a? Is you know what's the difference between the two of them? One is brotherly, and the other is like uh, I don't know what agape is. I don't feel like it's because Philadelphia. Yeah, love. yeah, unconditional. And typically we say this is a this is a higher love. This is um, and this is this is that. And there's a little bit of that, but sometimes the scripture uses phileo and agape as synonyms. All right, and so if somebody says, oh, no, no, that's phileo, that's not agape, that's different, because agape is this and phileo is that, it's like, well, you know, that's, that's not fully true. In this context, they're synonymous. Uh, matter of fact, when Jesus says, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me, he interchanges those words, and there's actually no, no, no difference in his, in his meaning. So, so even that little bit of what most people would say is common knowledge about Greek is... Sometimes true, often true, but not always true. And you don't know that if all you know is so. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to say that you're not smart enough to study the Bible. You are. You're, st you're smart enough to study it. But just in, in a good English translation is a, a translation you can lean on. You can lean on for everything you need for life and godliness. And... Um, and so, yeah. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to talk a little bit about this, uh, the whole Greek issue. Mm -hmm. So, in Bible college, I, I, I took a lot of Greek and had about three years of it from like Greek 101 up to advanced exegesis. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I learned towards the end was that reading a text in English in context uh, gave me just as much insight as reading it in English. Yeah. Um, mm. the, the people who write these translations, the committees, these are full committees of people, the incredible scholars who, who do these translations. Most. 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 <laughs> some. I don't even say some. I don't even say most anymore. 
-hmm. if you have a good translation, uh, you are not missing a whole lot yeah. uh, from your English translation yeah. to what you get in Greek. And then with the whole argument of, and, and I hear people say the same thing, oh, but in the Greek it actually means this. And the second I hear it, I always tune them off because they, I know instantly they don't, they don't know Greek. Uh, because in Greek, just like any language, uh, words don't really have a dictionary meaning. They have a dictionary uh, semantic range, mm -hmm. um, but context uh, defines a word in every situation. It's always context. The, the Greek dictionary is that big on my desk, you know, and that, again, it's like an English dictionary. One word can mean lots of different lots things. Of Has a semantic range is a good term, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? The one thing that, uh, if, you know, the one difference with Greek and English um, that is legitimate, or Hebrew and English, um, it's kind of like somebody has put it this way, and it's true. Um, it's like the difference between watching television in black and white and watching it in color. You know, and watching it in color. Yeah, you remember what black and white television is? Probably going to come back in soon. It's going to come back. Didn't you? Didn't you have that in, in PR? I didn't know that was Yeah. Thing. yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, but um, so there is there is a profit to it and it's a good profit, but it is not an essential thing, and certainly not essential at what you're doing. Um, it, it, and so, um, so yeah. Uh, okay, so we got, um, any other thoughts on any of that before we do one more thing? So let's do this. Go to Mark chapter four. And, Let's brainstorm a little bit. Uh, and uh, Anne, we'll let you be the scribe. Is that all right? This Anne, you can be the scribe. Okay. It'll be easy. Um, we're going to read 4, 35 through 41. And, uh, and then we're just going to brainstorm on points of observation. We'll try to do it. Um, excuse me, a little bit in order of like we've done before because it's good to develop an order. And we're just going to go down and, and put together as many things as we have. And, and the only thing you have to do for scribing is not record the points of observation, um, but just, re just tally points of observation, okay. maybe under who, what, when, where, why, you know, how, you know this type of stuff. Uh, so let's read it first. And uh, Jen Connolly, would you read 35 through 41, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just go through it together. All right. On that day, when evening had come, he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in, a bo in the boat, and other boats were with them. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the, said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Okay, so let's just go through and say uh, first, first point of context, or, or I'm sorry, first point of observation is always what? What's that? Genre. Said so the first point a long time ago. Genre being what? Narrative. narrative. Okay, historical narrative. So we know that. Uh, and then let's go down who. So who are the who's? The disciples. He said to them, Jesus said to the disciples. Okay, so we've got, we've got Jesus, we've got uh, disciples. We've got a crowd. Got a crowd. Where, and, and give us what verse you're in. Uh, 36. Verse 36, we got a crowd. Mm -hmm. Any other who's? I don't like there's some other boats, so I don't know if there's other folks in the boats. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, boats that are probably not empty. Mm hmm. Any other who's? You count the waves in the sea as characters in the sea? You know, it, it's, a good, it's a great observation. You say, well, I know the sea is not a who, but he certainly does talk to it like it's a who. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would, I would mark that down. And again, we're, we're, we're here to make observations. We'll, we'll figure out the significance of them later. 
So, yep, mm -hmm, I would, you know, somehow I'd just be glad I saw that, whatever caused me to see it and, uh, and, and note it. Uh, any other who's? Okay, what about who, what's? What's, what's happening, what's going on, what's what? What are the what's? The great windstorm. Okay, there's a great storm, yep. Mm -hmm. C is a, is, a, is a what, and that's kind of where they are, okay? So it's, it'll come up again, but, but we notice that there is a C here. What else? Boat. Boats. Boats. Mm -hmm. A crossing. It's a crossing, okay? Sleeping. Yeah, that'd be a good what to note. Uh-huh, Jesus is sleeping. What else? A windstorm. There's a windstorm. The great fear. There's a fear, a great fear that'll if we don't come up here, we're, it'll come up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. What else? You're leaving the multitude, but it sounds like some of the multitude still clinging to them. Okay. Uh huh. What else? There's a stern, which is, happens to be where he's asleep, I guess. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. Not only that, but uh, isn't there also a cushion? You know, is that is that significant that he's asleep on a cushion? I don't know, but but it mentions a cushion. I. We'll put it down, uh-huh. Any what other what's? They wake him up. Okay. Okay, he's awakened. Okay. A rebuke. There's a rebuke, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a rebuke that comes in. Mm-hmm. Any other what's that we should take note of? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting what. Uh, not only dies, uh, but, uh, but maybe, you know, interesting word, it became perfectly calm. Why, does he, why did he use the word, you know, perfectly as an interesting word? Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a what, but an observation, you know, is that their initial fear is the storm. And then in verse 41, their fear is, uh, appears to be directed towards, towards him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good observation. We don't, want to, we don't want to venture to say why that is yet. But we should note there's that a there's a change of fear. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a key observation uh, that, that we should note there. Mm -hmm. Figure out later what it means by, you know, what, what the significance of it is. Any other what's? Um, who, what, when? When? Any when's? Okay. Evening. Okay. Is it important? The day also. You know, it says on that day. When evening, any other whens? Just as it was. That's interesting. Where? What verse are you in? Bottom of thirty-six or in thirty-six. And and he took along with them just as he was uh, in the boat. Okay. Yeah. This seems to be. See how quickly they're leaving. Like, come on, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Good. You know, you note it down and say, you know what. What, uh, you know, what, what should we draw from that? What other, what are we on? When's? When's? You awoke at some period of time. Okay. You awoke. Mm -hmm. Some period, I guess, yeah. Uh, any other when's? Immediately. Immediately is always a, is always a, 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 a mark of time. Mm-hmm. Good. Oh, just the, the wind and the sea oh, obeyed him immediately. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah. that's always a mark of time. And what verse are you in there? Uh, I don't think they have the exact word for immediately. I'm just inferring that. Oh, okay. Well, we're not inferring here. We're, 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 we're observing. So we, don't, we wouldn't put that down. Yeah, in verse 39 is where he rebuked the wind, said, Hush be still, and the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. Yeah, no wind there. My translation does say suddenly. So, okay, if then at least in your translation, the uh, que question is it, is it something there or not? What translation are you using? The uh, ESV. Um, NLT. Uh, I, I will almost guarantee you, your suddenly, suddenly is yours alone. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could be wrong, but I think I'm probably not. 
<laughs> it's consecutive. The first thing that happens is Jesus rebukes it then. That could be a when. It comes after after he rebukes it. There is a sequence there. That would be a good. And with yeah. Joel, is like when is it that their fear goes from the storm to Jesus? It's after the after they see the wind. And the wind mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be a good 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 observations. Mm -hmm. Who, what, when, where. And some of these, you say, well, where? Well, we already talked about boats, lakes, all these things. We got them in what's. It doesn't matter where we make these observations, as long as we're, as long as we're noting that they're there and we're thinking about them. But, but are there any other where's? This is the Sea of Galilee. It's James and John's home route or home lake. Okay, do we know it's the Sea of Galilee? Well, at least not from this text, we don't. But, but, we, but there is a where. A where is a sea. And so we, it, when, we get, when we get outside of our observation into kind of answering the questions of our observation, we better figure out what C it is, you know. Yeah, so that'll be important. But the observation is, what is it? Are they on a sea or simply on, in, a, in, a, in a boat? You know, they're, on, you know, they're in the water somewhere. Um, so um, other who, what, when, where's, other where's? We talked about the stern, that would be aware, asleep in the stern, the back of the boat. Any significance? I don't know. Saw a boat, well, I won't go into that. Um, uh, any other wares that we should note? They are crossing to the other side. Other side, yep, good wear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be aware. Who, what, when, where, uh, why? Remember, why isn't application? Why is, is the text telling us, you know, in here, <clears throat> it would have been that they uh, let us go over to the other side so that we may, you know, it's not here. Maybe it's in, maybe it's in Josh's translation, but. Uh, <laughs> 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 just, just kidding, Josh. But if it had that, so that we may, that would be a why, you know, because it's stating, it's, it's answering the question itself. But it sounds it, like they're trying to leave the multitudes. Mm -hmm. um, but are we, do we have any whys here? 36, and leaving the multitudes. Uh, that's, that's a what. I don't know that it, I would think it's a why. Again, they're not telling us why they're leaving. Jesus wanting to be alone left the multitudes, that would be a why. Could the quite literal why in verse 40 be counted towards that? And he said to them, why are you so timid? Um, how is it that you have no faith? It does, you, know, you would think that a why would answer the question why, um, but probably still we're not getting a, it's not saying why he asked. And, and again, not all the questions will be answered, um, but we just want to make sure that if something is there that's telling us why, that we don't miss it. What about, so we don't want to make it up, but we don't want to miss it. What about verse 41? They feared exceedingly, and then they're saying to each other, who can this be, even that the wind and the sea obey him? So they feared because, so the why would be because the wind and the sea obey Jesus. Um, I, I, think, I think that why would, would probably, st you know, it's still not an implied. That, that would be an interpretation. You're getting into interpretation, which you're going to figure out lots of whys in interpretation. But here we're, look, we're trying to observe whys. And I, don't, I think maybe the answer is we don't have any whys in this text. Within verse 40, um, it's interesting, some, just something I just noticed, that Christ, Jesus is still asking why they're afraid. Have you still have no faith? And they appear, they, they, you know that they're afraid of Jesus, but Jesus doesn't seem to be, I don't know if he's using irony in that statement when he says, you still have no faith? Because he must know that they're afraid of him, because the text clearly states that they're afraid of him. But Jesus, in his response, in his reaction to them, doesn't seem to be aware of that. Or he's being ironic when he says, you still have no faith. So I don't know if that's like kind of shedding light on his humanity. Like, did he not? You're, you're into interpretation, Raymond. Um, don't go there yet. Stay with observation. We're simply observing. We want to, we'll interpret later. I'm just wondering this uh, observation 
stage, since there are other accounts in the other Gospels, would you read them at the same time and keep this isolated and just stay? Typically, you want to stay here. You want to stay here until you're done with it, and then maybe go and, and pull out some things. Um, but, but typically, you want to stay here because just as much as everything Everything in the, the Holy Spirit put everything in this text that he wants us to have to, uh, to grasp the text in a sense the Holy Spirit left some things out of the text So that we would grasp what we need to grasp in this text and so so yeah, I mean it, it's it's okay to go but But you don't want to take every every gospel account and make it a compilation of a harmony of all the gospel accounts so Josh should we look at a greater context? Because they get to the other side, he cast, uh, heals a man that's possessed by demons, he gets right back into the boat, and they go back. So is, is that maybe why? That's an interpretation. That's an interpretation. It's an interpretation. Again, why? We're, we're looking at observations, those things that the text puts in front of us. You know, and again, that's why I say whys are, are, are often that, in order that, so that. You know, that they are, they are declarations. We're going to answer lots of whys, or we're going to try to figure out lots of whys in interpretation, but here we're just observing. So don't be afraid to say, I don't, you know, you want to see everything you can see, but you don't want to make things up. Just, you know, just so you have a, have a lot. Who, what, when, where, why, how. how, you can ask how, any hows. Yeah, that'd be a good, how would be a good one here. What's, a, what's the first really good how? What's that? Okay, how'd they cross? By boat? Okay. Rebuked. Yeah. Rebuked. rebuked. Yeah, that's an obvious, you know, how did he calm the, the you know, he, he rebuked. Um, and maybe that's a what, too. He, somebody, I think somebody said that in rebuke. So if we didn't get it in a what, by the time we start asking, how did these things happen? And, oh, well, I really need, yeah, that's right. I'm that's surprised they do that. I think it's well, well, how like a subset of, of uh, what. I mean, you always see that the five W's is always a good way to look at it. So yeah. if you're going to do how, it's just a subset of what. You know, and, and there again, the, the, the key issue is not classifying them under their right category. The key issue is they are just a pry bar to get us to see. Mm -hmm. um, and so it real, in the end, it doesn't matter if we see that as a how or a what, functionally speaking, as long as we've observed it in our, in our eyes are now thinking, our mind is now thinking about it. That's the key to observation. Uh, any other hows that we should keep in mind? Uh, things repeated, uh, things emphasized. Oh, we are out of time. Uh, things related, uh, key words, uh, last 30 seconds. Any, we should, we, anything else that we should pull up out of this and say, you know, I need to, uh, I, I need to look at this. Yeah, you look through, anybody? Look, I don't know, is it, is it in things that are compared or contrasted, is it, am I going too far if there's a storm yet he's sleeping? Um, I, I think that would be a good comparison and contrast, in, in contrast. There is a storm and Jesus is sleeping. That doesn't make sense. There's a storm and everybody else is nervous. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a good comparison and contrast. Uh, look in verse 38, and he himself was in the stern. He himself, what? What's that? It's emphatic. It's, you know, he was in the stern is all you have to say. He himself is in the stern is like repeating he, that is he, was in the stern. So it's an, it's, it's an emphatic repetition of something that, that doesn't need to be there. Um, you know, we have a, uh, you know, probably a really important word, a matter of fact, probably a very important word uh, in verse 38. Uh, and this, this, matter of fact, it is important, but um, you, might be, you, might, you might miss it until you actually do more work. What is the word, Joel? Verse teacher, teacher. Um, when you when you kind of unpack this, you're going to realize, huh? There's a lot in that word teacher that doesn't that that accounts for for why after the storm gets calm, they are afraid, you know. And and again, there's this there's this climactic this building. At some point, he's a teacher, and at the other point, they're a, they're afraid of him. Who is this? Who the winds and the sea obey him? This is a whole lot more than a teacher. Okay, 
Um, and you know, just on, and we're 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 over time. We got to go. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, maybe we'll do more on this later. So uh, we don't want to. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we went over a little bit. <laughs>